Collective ownership. So, uh, communism. Nah, nah, it ain't like that. It is that, literally. This is the commune. We're communists. <laughs> If you've been watching The Last of Us on HBO, there are various things that might stick out about it to you. How it manages to diverge from or expand upon the source material in a way that feels incredibly faithful, the fantastic practical effects and high production value, or the way it manages to give you an emotional gut punch with alarming regularity. Alternatively, you may have noticed, and be mad about, the existence of gay people, period products, the figure and voice of a woman antagonist, and the use of the word communism without a 10 minute lecture on why it's intrinsically bad and killed 110 trillion people. It's an almost unavoidable feature of any major piece of media nowadays that the discourse about it is littered with people declaring it woke, too political, propaganda, or pushing an agenda, invariably because it contains, or worse, centers, people from the wrong demographics, and possibly even talks about concerns unique to them. Some commentators were made physically sick by the sight of a 14-year-old girl picking up a pack of tampons from a shelf, a scene so viscerally disgusting that it might happen in any supermarket across the world on any day of the week. This disgust was compounded by the scene several episodes later of her receiving a menstrual cup, although they clearly had to look up what it was to be disgusted by it, as at least one YouTuber confidently declared it to be a contraceptive, and used this misinformation to claim the episode had paedophilic undertones. Funnily enough, I don't recall anyone being equally appalled by the moment where the characters hoarded toilet paper. After all, as the book says, everybody poops. It's only women who menstruate, and rather than being recognised as a natural bodily process, this is something that society has long stigmatised, and men who've never grown up, especially if their understanding of women is distant and theoretical, view as icky and only worthy of ridicule. Speaking of women, one was in charge of the hunter group who took over Kansas City, and this again got certain people's backs up. Melanie Linsky, who plays Kathleen, had everything from her mannerisms to her look scrutinised in a way that a man who was in charge wouldn't, because she wasn't a shouter or a stomper, some sort of stereotypical Ms. Trunchbull character. She was someone with a milder, almost friendly demeanour, underpinned by a coldness that allowed her to turn in a moment from sounding utterly reasonable, almost pleading, to committing or ordering atrocities. The sort of character who, if a man, would be easily recognised as more sinister than any shouty baddie. See Max Shrek in Batman Returns or Hans Lander in Inglorious Bastards, among many others. As with any type of character, there's plenty of discussion to be had over the writing and performance of that role, but criticism built entirely on Kathleen's gender and the idea that nobody would follow a woman unless she cartoonishly stamped her authority, more often than not coupled with attacks on her looks, can't be taken in good faith. It's pure culture war, lashing out at a character for not fitting in with the worldview of those with clear lines on what roles women can take on and how they must present when taking on those roles. Episode 6 of The Last of Us, of course, didn't just have a woman, and, at that, a black woman, taking charge of a place and menstrual products out in the open as a simple matter-of-fact thing. She also uttered the word communism, and in a positive way, too. Whether or not communism works in real life isn't the point here. A self-governing Jackson, which shares duties and resources and elects a council to coordinate that, has more in common with the communism of the Spanish Revolution than that of the Soviet Union, and it was external forces, rather than not working, that brought it down. But a pamphlet on Spanish anarcho-communism and a discussion of the various forces at play in the period isn't going to win over those who immediately leapt to outrage at a word. Equally, there's little point trying to reason that of course Jackson is communist. Regardless of real-world politics, it makes perfect sense in a post-apocalyptic situation for people to organise their society in a cooperative rather than competitive way to foster the unity they need to protect themselves from a hostile outside world. Incidentally, how people will organise themselves after the collapse of the existing social order is an inherently political question, and if you think you have an apolitical answer to that question, you just have an answer that aligns with your own politics. The point, again, is that none of this is rooted in critical discussion of the episode as a piece of media and storytelling. The view that it is bad at those things is tacked on by those already angry that it not only didn't play into, but actively outraged their personal political biases. It's an abdication of critical thinking, not an example of it. Nowhere is this more evident than in the reaction to the two episodes that have suffered the most backlash from right-wingers and homophobes. They are, of course, episodes 3 and 7, because of their promotion of the dreaded gay agenda. Or, being more honest about it, the fact that they focused on the stories of the types of people that those review-bombing the episodes are violently intolerant of. The cover story for Hate on episode 3 was that it was a diversion from the source material. Bill and the game was still gay, though you'd be surprised how many people were resolutely blind to that fact. But his and Frank's story played out very differently, and the change was bad. 
There's an interesting discussion to be had about how the differing versions of Bill and Frank's story affect the themes of the narrative. Game Bill serves as the extreme version of Joel's viewpoint early in the story, that caring for others will get you killed, and represents a position he moves away from as his relationship with Ellie evolves. On the other hand, Joe Bill represents the notion of the protector, whose purpose only emerges with someone else to care for, and a role Joel moves into with Ellie. It establishes a theme that echoes in other characters, showing us what becomes of protectors who fail, those who lose their protector, as well as in Ellie's relationships, and why she clings so fiercely to Joel. But once more, it's easy to see through those who don't want that discussion, and instead just don't want gay people on their television. Because as soon as we get left behind, a rigorously faithful adaptation of the game DLC of the same name, they're no longer concerned with sticking to the source material, and move the goalposts to declare that both gay episodes are simply filler that do nothing to advance the plot. That may well be true for some people. I have no doubt that there are those who view The Last of Us solely as a story about fighting infected and savage humans in a brutal post-apocalypse, and entirely miss the point that this was just a backdrop for a character study of humanity, and specifically how the relationship between a father who lost his child and a child who has lost everyone grows from antipathy to affection. If you only played the game for the action, or only watch this type of show for the gore, then of course episodes which expand the characters and establish or emphasise the narrative's themes will feel like filler. Not everyone who is media illiterate is a homophobe, or virtually all of those whose reaction to these episodes is based on homophobia is media illiterate. It doesn't matter whether they genuinely don't get the point of these episodes in the story, or are playing it up to save their audience. What matters, again, is that a type of people they dislike are the focus of a story and they're mad about it. But they can't just say that nowadays, which is why they have to resort to code. You're not required to enjoy The Last of Us TV show, or any other piece of media. You don't have to agree with my or anybody else's interpretation of a story. You don't have to share any of the politics presented in the story. And you're even entitled to not enjoy a thing if it goes too far against your politics. It doesn't inherently make you a bad person. Just be honest about your position. Because the culture war raged by the right wing is inherently dishonest. They know that most people, whether they liked episode 3 and 7 of The Last of Us or not, don't have a problem with gay people, and within that a good majority will actively disavow open homophobia if confronted with it. That's why they spin any response to actual bigots as an attack on fans, and why they have to present all of this as an agenda. Sure, oh, we don't hate gay people, but there's this ideology called wokeism that's taking it too far, because apparently, not hating people for who they are is something you can take too far. And if you believe gay people on TV is part of an agenda, rather than just stories representing people who exist in society, then they can walk you a little further into their political camp. Because of course the agenda doesn't stop at TV. There are LGBT plus people in society too, and soon you'll learn to see them merely existing and being accepted and safe from harm as something that needs to be stopped. Those who peddle the culture war on YouTube and Twitter will make no secret of their support for the likes of Trump, even while saying that it's the media, by daring to tell the stories of people who belong to demographics that they hate, who are making it all political. Don't believe them. They will focus on the likes of episode 3 and 7 of The Last of Us, and centre all of their criticism on the existence of LGBT plus people at the heart of these stories, even whilst insisting that everyone who dislikes these episodes is being called a homophobe to silence criticism. Don't believe them. The agenda of the culture war in media is to make taboo the representation of people, views and issues they don't support, and in doing so to prop up the culture war in wider society, to resist and roll back advances in equality. The arguments they make as cover for that are not made in good faith and represent the thin end of that wedge. And even if the culture war framing of discussions around media didn't stand in the way of enjoying the things we like, in service of getting us mad enough to accept the imposition of harmful politics in the real world, it would still make it harder to actually think critically about the media we consume. Because instead we keep getting sidetracked by false controversies manufactured by grifting bottom feeders. If you enjoyed this video, then give it a like and consider subscribing to keep up to date with all my content, like the video that's just popped up, which YouTube thinks you should watch next. Check out the links in the description to join my Patreon for as little as £1 per month, or donate to my GoFundMe and get your name in the credits of my videos, like those rolling up now, who I want to thank for supporting me and my content. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.